Welcome everyone. We'll get started uh, right away. Uh, start with roll call. Uh, Mike Langer. Present. Juan Rivera. I'm here. Thomas Trott. Present. Neil. I see Neil. Not yet. Not yet. Expect Neil to join us. Uh, Grant's here. Uh, Kim? Here. All right. Uh, so we do expect Neil to join us, uh, but we have a quorum. So we will move forward. Call Officially call to order. Uh, let's go to the flag salute. Just put the flag here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, that brings us to our uh, first opportunity for public input um, for items that are on the agenda. Uh, if you have, uh, if you have would like to share anything on the, that's on the agenda, uh, please put your name and email address in the chat. Justin will be monitoring that. We'll call you in that order. We've got about 60 seconds. Seeing anything, Justin? No, not at this time. Okay. All right, so we will move on to the consent agenda. So hopefully folks have had a chance to review the minutes. Uh, we have vouchers and payroll. We do have uh, two resignations, uh, revised winter sports contract, adding a coach to the middle school, and two referral, referral bonuses. Um, are there any questions? I had one about opening up to others. Any questions on any items on the agenda? Kim, I had a question on the on the resignations. Um, we have two teachers that are leaving at the end of the school year, and uh, I think it's an EA that's leaving uh, relatively immediately, a couple of weeks. What's the process for exit interviews? Um, how often do we do those? What, what's been our practice here? I guess in more yes, be, recently. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. So we um, just capacity wise have not conducted exit interviews with all employees who leave our system. Um, what is more typical is if we have an employee who's living, leaving our system mid-year and we don't already have a very clear understanding about the reason for that departure, if we believe that that departure is in some way related to um, their experience that they've had as an employee, um, then we would conduct an exit interview. Often that would be done with their direct supervisor, sometimes people here at the district office. I do know that we've conducted two exit interviews um, since the start of, the, of 2022. Thank you. You are welcome. Any other questions on the consent agenda? Oh, Mike? Uh, yeah, Grant, two things. It looks like uh, Neil just sent a note in saying he's uh, uh, Zoom is, has updated or something. He's trying to get on, so he'll join us. Okay, soon. he's coming. All right, thank you. Yeah, and then, um, you know, before we vote on this, I know we'll have plenty of time to do this later on, but um, in addition to some of the longstanding teachers and so forth, uh, Kim's note is in there. And uh, uh, I don't think we should probably let this go by, at least from, you know, I'm sure I speak for all of us saying that, uh, Kim, your service has been extraordinary and uh, uh, your commitment to this district and to our community, um, leading not only in the district, but also spending an extraordinary amount of time um, leading and joining community um, based activities as well. So thank you for your service. I know we'll get more time to do this, but uh, things, the formal resignations in here, I thought going on the record and sharing our appreciation was due. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it has been an honor um, to, to serve this district and community. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Wilson. 
Well, if there are no other questions, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move. This is oh. <laughs> Sorry, Juan. Juan, would you like to second? I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> consent agenda is approved. All right. Our next item is a resolution around teacher assignments. I think we have one new assignment. Can you want to walk us through that? Sure. Just give me one second here. I apologize. So, <laughs> excuse me. Um, we have the, a resolution. It's resolution 21 14, the approval of the assignment of teachers to classes other than one in their endorsement or in their endorsed area. And so this is a resolution that would allow um, that to occur. And so, um, Sean, is there anything else that we need to say about this? The resolution is there and then you'll see the accompanying, accompanying attachment that highlights the addition of a teacher to um, previous board action that has been taken for out of endorsement teachers. And so this case, it is a, a teacher at our high school level um, who is teaching um, mathematics courses and her degree, her, her certification area for her current endorsement is CTE mathematics and she has a substitute certificate. So she has both of those certificates. Um, she's teaching math for us, but she is not endorsed as a math teacher in the state of Washington. I think if I could add anything, Kim, it would be that she has her doctorate in mathematics. And so she's definitely able to teach this curriculum, um, just not necessarily certified within the Washington state system. Great. Thank you. And board members, any questions? If not, could I get a motion to approve resolution 21-14, assignment of teachers unendorsed? This is Neil, I'm look. here. <laughs> I will second that motion if someone else was already making it. I was trying to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thomas moves, Neil seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, approved. All right, our next item on uh, old business is the mass action la uh, vaping lawsuit. Um, and that's, it is mass action, not class action. I had to look that up myself. Uh, we talked about this a little bit at our retreat. Um, so primarily uh, this is a uh, vote to, to join. Um, there's no, obviously no cost or uh, some minimal effort that some uh, staff time, probably half a day to a day's worth of staff time to in the participation um in this in this effort uh primarily they're uh looking to you know seek damages for illegally targeting underage children um and if uh if and when uh there was a resolution to this effort uh, legally that they, you know, whatever those funds were we would likely have pretty good discretion with those we don't obviously we don't know what the amount or if it uh where it's going to go but uh I mean, I think the, we'd want to talk about how, how we'd use those funds. I think you know, probably around uh, some of the monitoring, uh, drug treatment, education, those types of you know things that, that uh, help kids that might be impacted by these things. So I know we talked about this a little bit at our uh, training. Um, are there any, any questions, uh, concerns uh, um, before we? I have, I have just a concern. Yeah. Uh, when you read it in number six, and it says no upfront costs uh, beyond approximately two to five hours of staff time, and it says that twice. Also in number eight, uh, letter Charlie, it says beyond five hours. So that was my only concern is are, they're going to charge us something after two to five hours. I think that means it, it, it would it would require about two to five hours of our staff's time, administrative mm -hmm. staff time, to provide information um, to the lawsuit. So correct. Um, okay. In kind staff time. 
Yeah, that is to, to provide them the information specific to our district that would be necessary for us to join in on that lawsuit. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. That was a good clarification, though. Other questions, comments? If not, I uh, hear a motion to approve uh, joining the mass action, action vaping lawsuit. I'll make a motion that <clears throat> we do. Thank you, Thomas. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thanks, Michael. We have a second. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right, so our next item is uh, related to an earlier item, uh, <laughs> our superintendent search. Um, so Kim, has, uh, we've done a little bit of uh, research on research firms, and I think we have as our guest here yet. Yeah, okay, we have yes, we do. We, we have um, Tom Rockefeller, who is with Northwest Leadership Associates, and um, our school district has not entered into agreement with this organization, but um, Tom was willing to spend some time with us tonight since it has probably been close to 30 years since the school district um, went out searching outside for a superintendent. And so um, it's, it's been a, a while, so I thought it would be good to have an expert come in and share with the board and our community um, a the process that many school districts undertake as part of that search. And so we have Tom with us here tonight. Um, Justin, if you could do what you need to, to, to allow Tom to share his screen, should he so choose, um, mm -hmm. I would appreciate that. And without further ado, Tom, take it away. Okay, okay thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do want, want you to know that I'm more than glad to go through the process, even if you go through or go to another search firm or you feel that somebody else wants to do it, but we do um, spend time with school districts once in a while explaining kind of the processes that, that have to take place. Uh, for us, we have a four phase uh, process that is actually 12 steps. And the uh, first one is to, uh, you know, to secure a contract with you and like right now, you're at, you're you're in a good place. You're not late or anything else. This is typically when uh, a lot of the searches start. Some people, for some reason, have started uh, a lot earlier. Uh, with you know, their superintendents announcing a year or a year or more beforehand that they're going to to leave. But uh, a, a couple things will happen fairly quickly. And, and I'm just giving you from our perspective what we do. <clears throat> if tonight that you, you said something like, well, we're gonna go ahead and go with you as a search firm, we would put out pre-announcements immediately. And this would be on all the major uh, organizational sites. Uh, and at the same time, we'd need to get a liaison with the um, school board, either the school board chair or, um, you know, if you want the superintendent leaving in good stead, a lot of times we work with the superintendent or if you're assistant soup or somebody, but then we'd start developing a, a process fairly quickly within a week, we would want to meet with the board and <clears throat> develop, first of all, uh, an end time uh, when you want, would want this completed. And then that would set everything backwards where we would develop a, a calendar. But there are th three or four major uh, components to this. And the first one is, is starting to collect information on uh, <clears throat> for to develop a brochure that goes out with our application. And there's, there's th three big parts to that. The first part is uh, the selling part, which is a description of, uh, of your district, of your community, and it, and it gives the people that are applying or candidates an idea of what the district is about. But the two important parts to it are the challenges, which is something that 
uh, we would work through two different ways. First of all, we within probably a week and a half or two weeks, we would put out a survey and the survey uh, asked four major questions. And at the same time, we would, uh, we'd probably wanna have focus groups within the next couple of weeks too. And that would be the board would identify who it is that you're wanting to have input from and whether you're a, a board member uh, bus driver, custodian, teacher, community member, whoever, we come in and we ask for basic questions, you know, about the, the positives of the school district, the challenges of the school district, and then we look for those personal and professional characteristics that you want to see in the next superintendent. And we would try to develop the brochure off of those focus groups, and then from some of the information that you get from the surveys, um, to get that brochure put together and get the application and the brochure out so that you would have um, uh, at least five weeks of having your, uh, your application out there to give people time to look the district over to come and make the decisions to whether they uh, wanted to apply. But once once we get done with that, then there's there's a lot of work that has to happen in between, and that's setting up for preliminary uh, interviews. Uh, nowadays, anywhere from four to six people being on preliminary interviews. Uh, with those preliminary interviews, you would have a what we call observation or panelists. You would select twelve to twenty four people from your overall community to set and help the board decide on. Um, or give input, not decide, but help give input uh, from those preliminary interviews as who you would want to bring into your final interviews. And we have, um, you know, we set it up so the questions, you, you need to make sure in your preliminary interviews that all your questions are the same to each candidate. Um, there's some pretty generic uh, questions you should ask. There are some that you want to refine that have something to do with your challenges that you have in your uh, your district uh, that they, they'll have to respond to. And I'll explain that in a minute. But after you pick your uh, finalists, uh, then we would move into a, another phase uh, of the search. And what we like to do is uh, pre-negotiate the contract. And between the time that you uh, would bring us on, we would be working with a liaison, probably your fiscal officer or whatever. Uh, there are two big questions that everybody asks, and that is, is how is the board, are they getting along and how are things in the district? And then the second question is about the pay. You know, they're, they're going to want to know, and there, there are some challenges out there right now uh, with housing and these kinds of issues cost of living that um, it, it does take people some time to sit down and figure out if it's going to be a move that they can make or whatever else to do that but we would um, set up so we would have the contract set for the final three people and the reason we do that is we don't want somebody to interview in the final and then turn around and come back and want to negotiate after you've selected them. In other words, whatever, whatever you've set as your, your range or whatever else, we would work with that. And then there are several other parts to this, especially nowadays, uh, we do uh, have a private firm that does a complete investigation of the finalists. And along with that, that's uh, anything from checking out the internet to financial issues to anything that's gone through the courts or whatever else. And that's as much for you guys as it is for us that we don't want to be bringing candidates forward that would cause any issues. But um, there's this, you know, going back, then what we need to do is we would need to, you know, get, get up and moving fairly quick. And like I say, is it would be meeting with the board, setting a timeline. And the important dates in the timeline are, are when you want the, the process to end when you want to hire a, a superintendent by 
And if you were, were to ask, I would tell you that we need to be looking at the, uh, probably the first week of May would be about as late as you would want to go. Uh, it, but it isn't, that isn't late. It's just that there are other processes going on in the state. In fact, there's a lot of searches going on uh, right now so that you would be in the, the mix with everybody else. Um, but if we could get the end date, then we can move back when the uh, finalist interviews are, and then we can move back the recruiting period, and then we can move back to the, um, or the preliminaries, the recru recruiting period, and then the initial part of developing uh, the materials that you'll need to go out to the, uh, that you you'd put out for the application process. Is that too quick? You have to tell me. I've got it in my head, so you you need to ask me questions, and I'll be more than glad to uh, answer any of the pieces. But we do things such as, um, like when we post, we post to about thirty five hundred organizations and um, and individuals that we have on a database. Uh, we also post on all of the um, major. Um, organizational uh, sites that are connected to other sites uh, across the US. And, and then one of the things I think we do a little bit different, we have, we target people also. Uh, we send the blanket out, but we also right now probably have 100 to 150 people that are really wanting to be superintendents. And, and, and we have a uh, a pool of people of, on, on the west side of the state of probably a, a hundred people that, uh, that we write individual notes or we contact. We're pretty aggressive about it to get somebody that would fit, uh, you know, fit your district and, and what, they, what they're looking for as well as what you're looking for also. Questions? Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we have a few. I, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, so you, you mentioned earlier some of the uh, um, so the panels and then groups, 12 to 24 additional potentially community right. members, staff members um, that uh, so I guess I'm picturing that as the interview panel would be asking questions that the 12 to 24 additional folks are listening, paying attention, and then there's a kind of a debrief after. Right. Well, this is the, the panels, technically the, the um, school board should be the only one asking questions. Right. We make the choice, right? Yeah. yeah. And, we want, yeah. want to get input. Yeah. But, you, you know, if you picture, you know, the, the way I would tell you this, to do this, uh, the preliminary interviews would be you select four to pe six people and we'll be doing that in a, in a uh, executive session screening. The, in other words, if you have 20 candidates, I'd tell you to get four to six people out of the out of that pool, bring them forward. But you would be setting um, the last few that we've had have been in auditoriums, and you would be setting up front with the candidate. And between the board members, you would ask the same questions of each candidate. Then right behind you, you have an observation group that you've selected, and we have an application that we give to you that you send out to the. Uh, public and it's anywhere from 12 to 24 and it, it'll be your you could have somebody or a couple people from the business community uh, teachers association custodial group uh, it's made up of whoever you think needs to be there and they go along with you with the questions and they give their opinion and whether they answered them correctly or not and then behind them is the general public that they can come in and observe and they also have a little sheet that they can fill out that they, you know, sometimes I just don't like that candidate or that candidate really didn't answer the question. So you've got kind of your, your information, your take on it, then your advice from your observation group, and then maybe from the community too. And then what we'll do is we get together from there and sit down and you guys decide on the final three. And then, when you get to the final three, those are day long processes. 
And uh, they usually start out with uh, a board member or two and, and one of us meeting the uh, candidate in the morning. And then somebody like the transportation director takes them around the school district, um, maybe a principal or two um, takes them through one of the buildings or something like that. And then they'll meet with central office. They'll meet with building administrators. They'll meet with uh, uh, the classified certified. And then there's a community meeting. And in those meetings, those people get to ask questions. They, they get to ask questions of the uh, candidates and fill out little forms that they turn in that you guys will get. And then at the end of the day is where you as a board would meet with them for uh, an hour and a half or two. We always suggest that you have dinner with them. Also sit down and have a, a meal and then have an extended interview with them. And that is in the executive session. And because you are going to be discussing challenges, personnel issues, and other things with them, that they may have to take on. And then the last night or the day after the last interview, we'll get together and you'll take care of who you want to select. And, and then we'll verify through our uh, investigations and everything else are, are checking them out that everything's okay. And we take care of the people that don't get selected. You, you're the ones that call the person that does get selected. And then we finish up the contract. Uh, but we should have that, the contracts, like I say, we work to have those done beforehand. So it's just, it's a done deal when you, you, you aren't sitting around negotiating with somebody afterwards. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, he answered pretty much the questions that I was uh, thinking. So I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the face-to-face uh, -face interviews. Mm -hmm. um, I think those will be very, um, very important and, and weigh a lot. Yeah, the, 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 the community, you know, a lot of, you're, you're going to get a lot of questions. You know, the community wants to be involved, and we tell them that they – they get to be involved in um, uh, the surveys, you know, to start with. They, 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 they have that opportunity. They get to be involved in the preliminary interviews and they get to be involved at the, in the uh, final interviews also. And then plus the focus groups. And the focus groups, they usually, it lasts about two days. The, I did a set of focus groups last Wednesday and Thursday and we, we talked with 18 different groups of people. And we start in and we, and, and again, we ask the same four questions of everybody so that there isn't anything that goes sideways. And so we get that information, but the, the, the final interviews, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, the preliminary and the final interviews, it, you know, it's, they're up front of a lot of people and they're having the board asking the questions uh, and, and, and like I say, we try to tie it into the challenges, uh, at least half of them into the challenges. But the, the, then when they get to the final interviews, it's a pretty comprehensive day. And then if you, you know, you feel that you need to have more time or something to make a decision, that, that's up to you. You're not bound to, you know, say we have to make a decision uh, the last night, or you might want to say, we want to take two days, or we, we as a school board want to make some calls if we happen to know a school board member in the district they're coming from, or whatever. And there's just some different pieces. There's a lot more to it than what I'm saying. Uh, you know, we, we've been through uh, right out 350 of these searches, and, um, and, and primarily in the state of Washington. And we bring people from, uh, like right now, we have people that are uh, Malaysia, Georgia, Iowa, uh, Colorado. The, the majority of them are from Washington. And then you get Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, that uh, we, we have a, what we consider quite a pool of people to, that are, are really interested in, in being a superintendent. Could we... Um... Once we start looking at candidates, 
uh, and we narrowed them down to, you know, those last four to six or whatever the, that number could be, um, could we um, go back and interview on, like phone wise with um, that school district that, yes. that said individual is coming from? Yeah, the, 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 the reason that I, I and I want to make a distinction here, it, when the people, when people are applying, we keep, you know, we keep everything confidential until you select the six, the four to six people that you're going to apply or are going to interview. And the reason is some of these people, they don't want to put themselves out there. I mean, they don't, they want to get something out of it. If they're not going to make it to the preliminary interviews. They don't want the district they're coming from to know. But once you select the six and everything goes public. And then from that point, uh, what I would tell you, you're, you're very vested in the process. So if you're wanting to make calls and checkups, you know, our application has, they need four or five letters of recommendation, but they also need four references. And we call each one of those references, but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, do the same or be involved in it. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, generally. If it would be your organization that would get that information for us. Yes, yes. Okay. We, we do that, but that doesn't that doesn't uh, preclude you from take you, you know if you're wanting to check on things too. But we, what we'll do is we'll come to you uh, when we do the screening, and that is done behind closed doors. That's an executive session. When we do that screening, uh, we'll be real honest with you and say, "Hey, we've got 20 applicants, and these we consider top tier. These." If somebody in the top tier doesn't take a or want an interview, we'll move them there. And then there'll be some down here and just say, I, you know, they applied and we'll give you every name and we'll give you every file they applied. But I don't think that Rochester is up, you know, wants a third grade teacher from Oklahoma to even, you know, consider them. And, and, and we do get those once in a while. So we, we give you what we think, and then we'll give you all the background information too, and say, you know, this, this person's leaving a pretty tough situation. There's a reason that they're wanting to move other than just wanting to be a superintendent. Right. And when you said that the community is involved uh -huh. in this, what does, I know the community wants to have a voice in this, but what does their, their voice weigh? Does it, does it have a weight? Um, or is that on us to make that, that determination? That, that, that's on you. I mean, the, you know, when, when we get the survey and just so you know, when we do the focus groups, that's what we, because it's usually face-to-face -face or like this, we're running the survey also. It, it, it starts a couple of days before and that survey can run as long as you want to. Usually we do it two weeks. Uh, we've had a district or two said, no, leave it open for four weeks so we can garner as much information from the public. But we'll come in with the, uh, the challenges and then what, what they're looking for, the personal qualifications. And it might be a little bit different than what you, you know, as a board member are some real you know, challenges. You know, in other words, maybe the... Um, regular person out in the street doesn't know that you've got some financial challenges or something like that, that you're going to have to be able to put in that brochure. And the reason we put those challenges in there when they do their application, they have to address those in a, a page. We usually do a page per question that will let you see that, hey, this person has had experience in having to reduce staff or uh, move staff or uh, negotiations or something like that. Thank you. Michael or Juana, did you guys have questions? I thought I'd say unmute. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Go on. Okay, thank you. I have a question. So you mentioned uh -huh. that it's um, the 
screen is based on four parts and you said that the latest would be May. Would that be like the first part or that would be uh, phase four by May? The phase four, in other words, uh, hiring your superintendent. You know, the, a real important day for us is, is the board, you know, if you were to say, hey, we're gonna go with you, I'd say, please, within a couple of days, tell us when you want this to, you know, when you want to hire that superintendent so that we can back everything up and get all the different components um, you know, scheduled. And, and uh, one of us, it'll be me or Mark Hadaway, we'll be with you as soon as we can, the earliest board meeting to say, here's a, uh, a calendar that we've put together. You, you need to adjust it to the way you want it. And then that's what sets everything in motion. Am I answering your question? Yes, yes. I just wanted to know like how much time we have here. <laughs> well, and that it's really, that's dependent on you. Uh, also, you know, uh, there, there, there are people out there. I mean, and, and we have a couple other positions that we're searching for on your side of the state that we have people that are interested and, and you, you have a, a, a good district. I mean, in other words, there, there'll be people that will be interested in doing that. It's just how long you want to leave the position open or whatever that might, you know, somebody might find out, you know, two weeks before it closes or something like that. But uh, typically we, we try to have it done by the first week of May. And that, that gives them, you know, a full month before school's out because you know, we always suggest that the new superintendent spend a few days in the district, a, 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 you know, or a week or more actually to spend some time around to meet people, uh, get involved, have your present superintendent explain some things that are going on or whatever else. So what you were saying is, is that <clears throat> we would try to have this person hired before the end of the school year? Is yes. that correct? Am I understanding oh. that correctly? Yes. Okay. Most okay. definitely. Most definitely. I like I say my my suggestion would be the first week or so of May. You would be doing your final interviews uh, for sure that first week of May, if not the week before. I guess I have to cancel that trip to uh Cabo Wabo. <laughs> Well, that, there's Zoom too. <laughs> so my question was about timing also. So I think we're getting close to thinking the same line here. Um, and it really was, is everything done by May 1st? Like, you know, that means we've negotiated with the top three, their contracts right. in the middle of April or something in order to make that offer in the 1st of May. Is it aligned with our board meeting? I mean, we have a uh, two board meetings a month. The second board meeting in April is probably, I don't, I don't have the calendar in front of me, but what's that look like, Kim? On the 27th of April. 27th, so that's pretty close to the May. And the, and the first May board meeting is on the 11th. All right, okay. But if okay. But it would be at that board meeting, unless we call it a special meeting, that we would make a, um, a decision. Yeah, unless you called a special meeting to make the decision, and we uh, we I, I've had a lot of boards that they've called a meeting at noon, you know, two days after they are done that lasted five minutes, and they just opened it up, hired the person, and then shut the meeting down. Okay, all right. Yeah, I was going to ask you about you know if May is the latest, what do you think the earliest to get done would be? But given the um, uh, complexity of the process, I can't right. imagine you can actually get it done much earlier than that. So, uh, and and like I say, is you you're you're not in a bad. I mean, this is where everybody used to be, but what you've had is you've had some situations that you you don't have where <laughs> people were gone. I mean, there's been a few superintendents that have been gone mid year. There's been a few superintendents that we're gone real early in the year. And so it's it changed the pace a little bit with some okay. some of the school districts. But I, I mean, I, 
I'm comfortable. I would be comfortable where you're at. And I'd tell you to be the same for right now. I don't think that there's any issue if you pick that, um, you know, April, May or whatever, right around in there, that it would be, it would, that it would work. Okay. Uh, it, it would work fine. So, excuse me. I'm sorry. Got to turn this off. Tom, would you just clarify um, an offer would be made to a candidate, hopefully that first week in May, um, allowing some transition time, but the the new superintendent wouldn't officially start their contract with yeah. the school district until July 1st, correct? Right. The, the, yeah, in the state of Washington, they, could, they couldn't start until July 1st. And, and the interesting piece is, and if they're from the state of Washington, you can make them the offer and they can, they, they can sign the contract, but they'll have to resign their other, con they can only have one contract in the state of Washington. We take care of all of that, those kinds of things for you. Make sure everything's done legal. The uh, uh, final interviews, you know, we do certain things like we have a, a list of things that we share that will pass through your district office. It'll get out to your staff and the community. And, you know, there, there are questions you can't ask people anymore. And you have to be very careful of that. And that's just like in the preliminary interviews, we have a set of questions, whoever you tell me to work with board chair or with um, a designee from the liaison from the district will tailor those questions but you make sure you know the, the easy thing is is if you ask 10 questions and each board member has two questions to ask and if you deviate off those questions then we have to tell you to make sure you deviate with each candidate so that everybody gets an equal uh you know equal uh, say or whatever and then there's there's just a lot of little things that I mean, I could I could go on for a long time, uh, but it, it, as we go through the process, it, it's going to come clear <laughs> clear to you, you know, just just like getting the um, making decisions on who you want to have on those observation panels. You know, do you want uh, do you want twelve people? Do you want sixteen? Do you want twenty four uh, to get more people there? And how you divide that up, 12 from the school district, 12 from the community or, or whatever. Uh, but it does give a lot of connections with those people that they get out to other people so that they feel like they've been represented by uh, someone. And then they, like I say, there's two or three different, four different ways that they can be involved one way or another through the survey, through the focus groups, through watching the interviews and giving their input in the preliminaries as well as in the uh, finals. Thomas, I, I need to ask for clarification on one point again. Um, the July threw me there for a moment. Right. How is it just the professional courtesy that districts allow a superintendent who's leaving to go spend some time with a new district or how does that happen? I mean, uh, do we pay a side contract for them to do not, not a, usually what, what, usually what happens is you'll, if you want the new superintendent to come to your district for five or 10 days, we'll, we'll work with the other district, but what they do is they back charge you. In other words, they'll pay, they just flip the pay or whatever, and they, they'll pay for those days for them you to might, pay. We pay for their days. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And I, I will tell you, that's nothing to really worry about because most of the superintendents I know have way more days than the, you know, and, and personal days and other things that they haven't been able to use. And usually they use that so that there's no, they don't have to finagle with the money issues at all. Okay. They're Thank just you. able to come. But we, we, we will suggest to you that you have somebody that, um, you know, when you hire them that, they they should spend at least five days or more, you know, the five to 10 days if they can before July 1st. Other things? Oh, I, I don't think I missed 
much on there. I may have missed a few things, but uh, no, it, it, th there's a lot of uh, pieces that I, I think that we have a really good process. It proves out well. It gets it gets the community involved, gets the um, you know your your district employees involved in it. Now, you know, and everybody wants to say you know, and it, you know, it's just like with our uh, final interviews, we separate out the administrative central office people from classified if that's the way they want to do it, so that there aren't uh, groups that feel like they get overpowered by others, but we make sure that there's a lot of contact and a lot of input. You, you'll have more than you you want, probably, when it's all said and done, when you're making those final decisions. Well, Tom, th thank you so much for your time. Right, they, no problem. I really, really appreciate the overview. It was really good for us. Um, and uh, I feel better that if, if we can get this process started with the search firm right. in the next couple of weeks, we'll be on track to yeah, so, sooner the, the like I say is the big thing is getting it up and moving real yeah. quick and 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 you know we do things like again if you say you can pick a date, it, well it's open. If you told me to, I'd, I'd put things up tomorrow online that it's there's a lot of to to be announced or to be determined, but it is a vacancy is open. We get calls right away when we put those up and then that more information is coming is so that we get the dates determined or whatever else. So great. Well thank, thank you. you. I really appreciate your time and, and, and taking the hey, time to, to go through no, this with us. No problem, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for your time. This is Neil Turner. I've just been listening intently. So thank you for all the great information. It'd be okay. quite a quite a search to replace Kim. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, th those are sometimes the, the, it's a it's a good place you know like I say I think I know enough about what's going on in the state and the the group of people that we have as consultants are either or have been tied up in universities and professional organizations and we're, actually all of our consultants are from the state of Washington and we have a, a lot of people and you know I know I know some people that where Kim's going they're very happy to have her. She quality and I think the district is too. So okay. All right. Thank you again. Thank you. All right. So our next item, uh, expenditures. We have a, a laptop, Chromebook, two expenditures, laptops and Chromebooks. Uh, Justin, are you gonna? Yep, I can. I can speak to those. So, uh, it it is that time of year. At, uh, Grand Mound uh, teachers are up for their cycle of uh, change out of laptops, and so that's that that first one. Um, and then the the second one there is um, for the student student replacement of, of Chromebooks. We're on the cycle of uh, sixth graders and freshmen, and then uh, that would also include twenty five percent of the. Um, the RPS GMES uh, Chromebook fleet as well. So um, we'll be in process of a 25% uh, at, at K-5 over the next four years. And then that, that continual sixth grade and ninth grade uh, process here for Chromebooks, so. Okay. So for those two, do we need to take those individually for approval? Believe, yes, Shauna is shaking yes. Okay. So, uh, I would move to approve the expenditure for laptops. Any sorry, any questions or or do I hear a second? Yeah, Grant, I have a couple questions here. Yes, please. Okay, <clears throat> so this company, I did a little research on them. Who we're going through? <clears throat> They're based out of another state, I believe it's Ohio. And my question is, um, why are we going out of state to uh, purchase? Uh, these laptops, are we contracted with these, uh, with this company? Why aren't we trying to keep that, uh, that money over here closer to the, uh, to the home front? So the, the, the contract we're using is a KCDA contract, which is the King County distribution. 
contract uh, bid through the state of Wa bid bidded through the state of Washington, um, and uh, their price came in much better than um, Micro K12, which is another company I've used in the past out of Linwood. Um, but I was looking at uh, an additional five thousand dollars for teacher laptops and forty five thousand dollars for Chromebooks. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right, so I made a motion. Do I hear a second to approve the expenditure for laptops? I'll second. Thanks, Michael. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Laptop expenditure is approved. Move to the Chromebook expenditure. Any questions about that? I have a question. Did it, we, last year, we uh, made a vote for purchasing laptops for students. Could you remind me what grade was that for? Uh, the sixth and ninth grade. So r right now, right now, what I do with the Chromebooks is, as sixth graders come in, they they get a Chromebook. They keep that Chromebook for the three years. They're in middle school, and then ninth graders, as they come in, they get a brand new Chromebook and they keep that Chromebook for four years. That that same Chromebook. Um, and then what that does is that allows us to, as the middle school ones are, are three years old, that allows for parts for the primary and elementary uh, Chromebooks. Because after about three years, that's when they that's when those Chromebooks start needing more parts and, and whatnot. So. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions or a motion to approve the Chromebook expenditure? This is Neil. I will make that motion. So move. Thanks, Neil. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thanks, Juana. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Expenditure approved. All right. We have one other item on here that's not an attachment with it, but this is uh, to approve authorize Kim Fry, the superintendent, to enter in, into agreement with a superintendent search firm. Not necessarily the firm we just listened to, but they're one of the the kind of main three that uh, do 80 to 90% of the work in, in Washington state. Um, so in, enter into an agreement uh, on behalf of the board not to exceed $20,000. Um, and so it won't be in an agreement until we, we have a chance to approve that. But this will help us uh, get this moving. Um, anything else you wanna say about that, Kim? Yes, um, really the primary reason for this authorization is so that we don't have to wait another two weeks yeah. for you to come together again and authorize this expenditure um, because of that, that timeline, wanting to make sure that a new superintendent is named approximately that first week of May. So this would allow us to do that. Um, Grant has already mentioned the, the firm that we heard from tonight does the majority of superintendent searches in the state of Washington. However, there are a handful of other search firms that are um, more national um, that I can reach out to to get um, quotes as well um, if the board has a desire for, for that to occur um, for consideration of an out of area search firm. Um, when you go through the listing of available um, search consultants, there is another in our region um, that I did speak with. Um, they have recently um, changed their offerings as a search firm. Um, they used to do a comprehensive search and um, much like the, the one that was um, outlined for you this evening, um, but they have now changed and are cutting back on their services and they now just do the advertising portion. Um, if, there's any, if there are any school districts that want to, to just have advertising of, of their openings and um, email blasts out to various candidates. Shauna, did you have a question? No, okay. So Kim, does this, uh, Mr. Rockefeller that we spoke to tonight, Yes. Um, he does a na um, nationwide search also? He would do a nationwide search for candidates, but his organization is located in Washington. And so mm -hmm. they, um, he, he made a 
brief mention that most of their people who work for their search consultant firm um, have ties to the state of Washington through university programs. So um, often these search consultants are um, professors in superintendents credentialing programs. And so they have a um, built relationships with people who are um, becoming superintendents, if that makes sense. So that they have, um, they put feel, they, they, they've got a good pulse on who good candidates are that currently live in the state of Washington. Um, so th there's an advantage of going with somebody that's local. Yeah, I, 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 I see that too, but I wouldn't want to, just in my simple minded opinion, uh, just put all our eggs in one basket Correct. with, you know, for here. Um, we should explore other places um, that have different opinions uh, than this state's views. Right. So political, yeah. educational views. That so, needs to be spread out a little bit further. Yes. So, yes, they will search nationwide for candidates in any firm that we would um, enter into a contract would also search nationwide. Okay. Kim, what is the process? I mean, I'm certainly ready to go to give the authority to move, um, but how do you choose? Do you, um, do we do a bid or do we, is it a sole source or is there a preferred list that uh, the Administrators Association has or something we could draw from? How do we get the yes? There, there is a preferred list and that's where I got these names from, people that were reaching out to. Um, there is not a requirement because of the dollar amount to use an RFP process, although school boards can do one of those, but it will add at least a week to the process. So it, you would have to make a determination about whether you wanted to use that process or not. Um, I think the board should consider having at, two, at least two representatives from the board um, as a subcommittee to choose the firm. Oh, okay. Very good point. Um, There's something we wanted. Well, so I mean, two two things here. One, or, uh, any other questions on the proving the expenditure? And if we go through forward with this, um, can we talk about uh, folks that would like to be part of that uh, search firm evaluation recommendation? I would. Um, and I, I guess it doesn't have to be two of us. It could be all of us if everybody wants to. Uh, but I, I'm a, it'll be a, you know some time commitment to read few, read through their proposals and considerations and, and we're going to need to be, be able to get together relatively quickly to make that determination. And we, if there's, if there are three or more, we need to call it as a meeting. Yep. 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 I'm willing to do that. We can do it quickly. Mm -hmm. so. so any other questions on the authorization first, I guess, or if folks feel comfortable, uh, there's somebody making a motion to make the, uh, to, for the approval of the authorization to enter into agreement up to $20,000 or not to exceed. I'll move, Grant. Thanks, Michael. I'll second that. Thanks, Thomas. All in favor, say aye. 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 Right, any opposed? Okay. Um, so, um, Folks interested in um, reviewing potential pr proposals here in the next few days, and, um, able to, to make that commitment? Grant, uh, I, I, I missed what you're saying. I was trying to send uh, Justin a, a message. Okay. So uh, just asking so if, if board members are in. Uh, board members interested in participating in reviewing uh, potential uh, search firm uh, resumes and processes for the recommendation to for so the selection process, I should say. I would. Okay, Thomas. I would as well. 
others? Unfortunately, I don't think I'll be available uh, next couple weeks. I'm planning on taking a trip to Arizona to spend some time with my ailing father. So, um, Sorry. yeah, there's a chance I might not even be at the next board meeting. So just a heads up. Understood. Sorry to hear that. Well, if you can uh, rely on Thomas and I, then we won't have to have another meeting, although we will have communication as to <laughs> what we reviewed and, and the decision we came to. Thank you guys for volunteering. All right. Okay. All right, next items. Uh, we have first reading of, of uh, policies. Uh, so we're not taking any action tonight, but uh, just a, kind of a brief overview uh, on the changes. Sure. So the first one is a freedom ex of expression. And I'll do a quick um, share here. So um, in this um, policy, the blue is the rec are the recommended changes. Um, so there's an, a new bullet here. Um, under um, these are ma such materials may not incite students as to create a clear and present danger in the material and a substantial disruption of the school. So this is around student publications and that they shouldn't violate federal or state laws, rules, regulations, or incite the violation of such laws. So those are the, the recommended changes. Um, to that freedom of expression policy. Shall I just keep moving or other questions? Kim, I, I do have a question on this one, um, sure. particularly that we just signed into the vaping situation. I know it's not recommended, but right below the recommended language is information about advertising oh, yes. tobacco products, liquor and so forth. Can we just add vaping into there as well? Absolutely. Shana, can you make note of that, please? Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Great suggestion. Any others? And again, if you don't have to come up with them on the spot tonight, that if you think of something um, between now and the next board meeting, um, please um, reach out. And does this have anything to do with library books or anything like that? Um, this is around student publications and distribution of materials. So this is the section here on distribution of materials. Okay. So it doesn't have to do with the content of, of library books or textbooks, just the dis how we distribute materials and student publications. Hearing nothing else, I'll move on to the next one. And um, this is a health policy around accommodating students with seizure disorders or epilepsy. And I apologize for looking this direction of two screens and this is where the, the documents are um, projected here. And so the change to this policy is just an RCW reference change. So. There's no change to the content of the existing policy. Kim? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I believe if you scroll up to the top, it's going to say this is a brand new policy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Okay. And the that's why there's is just a link that's highlighted. Okay. I apologize. I was thinking because it was blue. So this is a brand new policy. And it has, um, you'll see up here that when we go through the review process, Shauna makes notes about who has been part of the review. So in this situation, prior to it coming to you, it went through a review of our special services director and our school nurse, one of our school nurses and, and my review, and then it's come here. So um, this has received the first phase blessing of our, our school nurse and our special services director. Yeah, our school nurses, RNs, LPNs, or RN. what? RNs? Yeah. 
So definitely take some time to review that. Again, if you have any questions, depending on the type of question, we'll we'll direct it to to one of our RNs or special services director, or perhaps Sean and I could answer it. The next one is also, <coughs> excuse me, in the the nursing area or medical area, it's infection control. And so this one, Shauna, correct? It's just the blue areas that are changes, not a, not a new policy. And they are uh, moving this policy to personnel. Yes. So it was a management support policy numbered in the 6,000s prior, and now it's been reclassified into personnel. And so it's a 5,000 policy. And so new heading about immunization here, new heading about blood and other potentially infectious materials, and then a change to this sentence that says, in the event that an employee has a specific exposure to blood or other potentially infectious material, the employee will be provided at the district expense with confidential medical evaluation and other follow-up and treatment required by law. So that change, and then the, the reference, cross-reference change here, and then the um, change in um, legal reference. So again, review it if you have any questions prior to our next meeting where we would take, a, take action with a second reading. Um, please let me know. Next bid or request for proposal requirements. <clears throat> Those of you who have been on the board for a while um, will become, you know, are already probably familiar with this policy to some degree because it is frequently updated. Um, it is one of the policies that undergoes updates on a pretty consistent basis um, as different state and federal regulations change. Often it's the uh, dollar amounts within the um, bid laws that change. In this case, um, they are calling this section, um, not just referencing state funds, but all non-federal funds, recognizing that there are, are potentially other sources of, of funding rather than those that come directly from the state. Um, but just a quick example of this would be, um, if there was a giant donation that came into the school district, we would still be obligated to follow all of these procurement laws. And then there's a whole new section about use of non-federal funds for improvements or repairs. And so it talks through the dollar amounts in the bid process and the RC references the RCW that um, over that governs this. Um, particular endeavor. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a whole nother section here about um, purchases of $10,000 or less that do not require quotes. Um, it, it does talk here that, however, the district must consider the price to be reasonable based on research experience, purchase history, or other information and must document this determination. So in the past, it was um, more ambiguous in terms of whether um, what we had to do to record the fact that we'd actually done the research. And so now it makes it quite clear that you must document that and so that we have that available for auditors when they do our annual audit. Talks about the self-certification process um, that we have to follow changes to that. And then a few changes in um, oh, this language in B mirrors this language that was up here talking about the research and documenting um, how we made our determination that it was a fair price. Trying to just more about self-certification and then a section on cost price analysis. So I'll let you read this. Um, on your spare time. And if you have any questions, again, this would be one, um, one area that I would direct your questions if you have any to Jill. Um, she's very knowledgeable about this, both in her um, 
former work as an auditor and then with all of her years here as a school district employee. And then the um, last new section is an um, interlocal cooperation. So we can help enter into interlocal cooperative agreements for purchases with other government agencies. So it explains that. And then the changes and references. Kim or yes. Shana, does these policies all have a, um, a specific category that they go in? Yes, they it, do. You got them broke down? Yes. Um, so, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. They're just bro they're broke down on um, on the website somewhere as mm -hmm. what type of policies where they fall into. Yes. Okay. So there, there's um, there are six different areas that the policies fall into, and they range from student policies about students, personnel policies, board of director policies, community are the big, big categories. Okay. <clears throat> then the last is um, use of electronic signatures. So um, there is one change to this. So it says that this policy may be modified, rescinded or replaced at any time by the superintendent. Um, the, there's a legal change here and now that um, policy, this policy can only be changed by the board, may modify, rescind, or replace this policy at any time. So that is the change to the electronic signature policy. So just as a, a point of reference, Thomas, right here on um, underneath the policy number, it, it shows that this is a section 6000 policy in that category for that policy is management support. So it's one of those six categories. So those are the first reading policies for this evening. Thank you, Kim. Um, if board members have a chance to dive into those more over the next week, uh, please reach out to Kim for clarification. All right, our next item, uh, board operating policy, our principal's policy. Yes, so um, at our board training um, with Dean Anderson, um, just over a month ago, right around a month ago, um, the board drafted some operating principles for what, you know, how you're gonna work together and you're gonna work with superintendent in terms of your commitments. Um, how you can make decisions, communication, those types of things, the role of the superintendent, the role of the board, and responding, how you're going to respond to citizen complaints or concerns. And so you had some, you know, you were all involved in the creation of these and then had some time to review the draft. And so this is actually putting all of that into board policy format and officially giving it back or giving you one more opportunity if you um, if there's nothing else you can think of, we can consider this the first reading of this policy, um, but it's also an opportunity for a kind of a one more chance to say, hey, you know, I was given this some more thought and I think we need to make an adjustment here, there or otherwise, you know. So what was, did anything else come to mind um, since you have had this, um, time together with this policy draft. Um, anything else you'd like to have changed before it officially gets its first reading? So Kim, you know I have a question. Sure. Under decision-making, the last one, can you clarify this? Um, um, it says the superintendent will make decisions on on implementation of policy operations of the school district management and direction of staff, et cetera. But I thought that was the board's responsibility. So, um, am I un not, am I just not understanding the point that it's making? So um, 
the kind of the different roles of board and superintendent. So the, the board is de determines the what, like this is what we want to have happen, mm -hmm. setting goals, setting policy, and you hire a superintendent to figure out how to make, how to reach that goal and how right. to enact that policy. So, oh. so really this is what's, what you're saying, what this is saying is the superintendent will make decisions on how to implement that policy. So the board's going to set the policy and the okay. superintendent's going to figure out how to make it happen. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Okay. That's why I just, I, I just put a question mark down here because I wasn't, you know, understanding it thoroughly. I was like, I, you know, just the wording of it. That's um, a great question. Thank you. And under the, under the board, and maybe this doesn't have anywhere uh, that needs to be on here. Um, as it's saying here, we are accountable to each other. Um, <clears throat> how does that reflect on, uh, <clears throat> say, people getting in trouble uh, with whatever, and you know, or social media problems, and so on and so forth? Um, should that be entered in here also, or is that just something? Should social media posts be added in here, or something along those lines? If people are making um, <clears throat> social media posts uh, that you know are a little bit too far outside the norm of things, what's what's right? Am I overthinking this? So that that really would be a discussion for all of you to have with one another. When I see that the statement that you will um, will be accountable to one another, it, it's just that I to me that that says that if you see something, and to use your example, if you see a social media post that mm -hmm. you think puts um, reflects poorly on the school district that was made by a, a fellow board member that you have a, you have an obligation to address that and yeah. so you're, you're going to just have a conversation with that person perhaps through the board chair okay or directly that says you know what I, I saw you post this the other day to to me that reflects poorly on the school district can we have a conversation about that and so you're just going to have dialogue um, and, and share your views and opinions. You know, some of the other things in here talk about how you're going to communicate with each other. So you're going mm -hmm. to do that in a really respectful manner. You're going to do that. Oh yeah. Um, you know, assume best intentions, assuming the best. And um, so you're going to going to go about that in a professional way. But that you would rather than just be mad about it or talk behind somebody's back about it, you would just go to the person and say. I don't know if you see it this way, but for me, this is what I, this was the reaction I had when I read that post. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, that was my, that was mainly my point about this is um, <clears throat> social media tends to get everybody, or you know, can get anybody in trouble because what you agree with and what I agree with are two totally could be two totally different things. So that's why I was wondering if that needed to be something added somewhere in here or or not. I think, or is that, that something that all of us as a board need to? I think it's something that us as a board need to address. Okay. Um, I, we, uh, I, yeah, personally, I think it would cover under the accountability to each other. Okay. Um, and you know, if we see something that's posted we think doesn't reflect well on on the school district, then we need to talk to each other about you know what the expectations are. Okay. Excellent. Anybody else see anything that they want explained or, or something for the rest of the board to consider before we put this into a first reading status? No comments. Okay. All right, then Grant, if you would like, we, we can just announce that this will be the first reading of this policy. First reading, yeah. So yeah, please spend some more time on it uh, the next couple of weeks. If you have questions, it's uh, our, our comments, additions, let's talk through them um, with the goal of uh, being able to formally approve it at the next meeting. 
All right, our next uh, is a thought exchange update review. All right, so our thought exchange um, closed. And so um, this is the inaugural debut of the report that is generated from that exchange. Um, before I go any further, just want to acknowledge that this, um, the reaching out to the community for feedback is something that came about as a result of some community members who came forward who um, asked the question, what is the board's um, operating principles when it comes to COVID? And we had nothing on paper. So we had been using, um, you know, as administrators in the district, we had been using guidance that we had been given from a variety of different sources, um, you know, listening to our public health officer, listening to the superintendent of public instruction, listening and reading reports from Department of Health, et cetera. We've been doing all those things, but we didn't formally have adopted as a school board um, any guiding principles to direct the work of administrators in COVID related matters. And so um, after that was brought about, worked with a communication specialist um, and wanted to put something forth to our community that was very neutral, but a starting place of um, some guiding principles. So what we did was we basically, as you know, as board members, is we documented um, what we felt was a reflection of our current procedure or practices, those things that we are currently um, using to decide, guide our decision making. And so that was the, formed the basis of, um, of the guiding principles. I'm gonna go over those guiding principles in just a minute, just to kind of refresh everybody. But I wanted to show you the report that was generated by um, Thought Exchange, and that this is what will be made public um, with before the end of the week. So everyone in our community will be able to access this report. So um, it reminds people what the, the question was. Um, so what are your thoughts or questions about the draft guiding principles? And um, is my screen showing? No. Okay, sorry. There we go. Can you see it now? Yep. All right. So the prompt after they read the guiding draft guiding principles was, what are your thoughts or questions about the draft guiding principles? Please be specific. So we gave them examples. I like whatever, I don't like, please consider adding whatever I wonder just to give some people some prompts. And so um, this is the report. We had 334 participants, 250 thoughts were generated, and there were 10,544 different ratings given to those 250 thoughts. And um, this is the breakdown um, of the question that was asked about when Rochester School District has discretion regarding COVID mitigation measures, which of the following best describes your preference on how the school district should respond? So we had a pretty darn equal third, third, third distribution of um, going above and beyond what the recommendations were whenever practical. So 30% of our folks said, you know, there's requirements, recommendations, we want you to do more than the recommendations when that's practical. We had 34% or 103 people um, said implement the safeguards as recommended. And then we had 36 or 108 of the respondents say implement only the required safeguards. So that was the breakdown in that. <laughs> this next part, when you go into the report, if you click on view, it will list the top thoughts. And so um, these are the top rated thoughts. That's this rating score here. So 4.6 was the highest rated thought within the exchange of the 250 thoughts. And then it keeps listing them in descending order. 
And this one happens to go, I think, to 3.8. So you can go through and you can study each one of these thoughts and look and see how, how those things were related. Another thing of interest is this. <coughs> these are the themes. So this system allows you to take all of the responses and then um, categorize the responses up to 15 different ways, 15 different categories you can use. And then it, that's the max that you can categorize for. And so these were the main categories, um, keep schools open. And if you hover over that box or tile, it will tell you that there were 41 different thoughts that someplace in the thought, it mentioned something about keeping schools open in per, into in-person instruction. And then it will also show you that the average of those 41 thoughts was a 3.8 score. And you can, um, we have 13 that were just expressing gratitude to what the district's been doing. And you can see their, their average score was 3.8 as well. Here's don't mandate vaccine, vaccinations, excuse me. There were 21 thoughts about that, 3.3 score. Star score rating, and you could go each of these. So we had more COVID communications were requested. We had 11 about no masks. We had, well, we had 21 that said don't mandate vaccinations. We had over here, we had 11 people who spoke to please require vaccinations or offer clinics. So what is also helpful about this is when you're in here, you can click into this and then actually read each of the suggestions or each of the comments about keeping schools open or whatever category it was in. And then you'll see in every one of these, there's always an other. And that's just where the kind of, um, if there's weren't multiple, um, ideas that were similar to group it with, it fit into that other category. So this is what the report looks like that everybody will have access to, and that will allow you to get into all 250 different responses and read them. So this will go out to everyone, um, we'll go out to families via email with a link, and then it'll be on the website as well. So people can go and, and look um, at that. What I was hoping that we could spend our time on next here is looking at the, the suggestions that were made. So there were, um, these are all the specific suggestions boiled down into the least amount of verbiage so I could fit them on one screen. Um, so um, they are here for us to look at tonight. And then <coughs> hopefully we can spend a little bit of time and talking through whether you want, based on these suggestions, whether you want changes made to the particular guiding principles that we put forth as draft. So I'll just, I, I apologize, I'm gonna read it to you, but I know different people are on different size screens right now, and it might be difficult to otherwise see if you're on a phone or something like that. So specific suggestions, the first one, on the list is acknowledge that Rochester School District cannot keep everyone happy. So as I'm as you're I'm reading these, I want you to be thinking board members about a suggestion is made. Do you think it should like work its way into the text of the guiding principles or not? Um, next one, link documents mentioned in number four. So number four is this, Rochester School District will continue to follow all legal requirements. Our district is required to follow the governor's proclamations, directives from the Washington State Department of Health, Thurston County Public Health and Social Services, offices of the Superintendent of Public Instruction and the Department of Labor and Industries. This includes quarantining protocols, close contact definitions, masking requirements and testing requirements. So that is the one where there are a couple comments here around referencing RCWs or linking the documents on our website. Okay. 
the next category here is um, a disagreement with statement number two. And their comment was there has been more exposure since the school since school started back. So I highlighted number two here. Students generally do better when they come to school daily. And the spread of COVID, COVID is lower in schools than in other group settings. Therefore, the district will focus on its efforts on keeping schools open. So this was somebody who took exception and didn't think that this was an accurate statement. I think yeah, I think maybe the clarification in there is uh, it's lower in lo lower in schools than in other group settings. Right. Doesn't and I think it hasn't increased. And yeah. Yeah. And the there's been more exposure since school started back. Um, Yeah, so we can double check the accuracy of number two with our public health officer um, or, or somehow qualified another way, take it out altogether, whatever the will of the board is. But the, that was the suggestion that was specific to number two. I think the CDC has that on their web, <clears throat> excuse me. I believe the CDC has that on their, um, on their webpage. Right. Yeah. About that, that specific one, I believe it is. Yeah. We can double check again, but I do believe that that's where this originally came from. Um, the next one was a suggestion to change the order of the governing governing agencies in number four to go um, to Governor LNI, Department of Health, OSPI, Thurston County Public Health to show the chain of command, and it. To me, it doesn't matter what order these are in. If it matters to one of you, you know, there, there's no issue in doing that. What I will say is that that is not necessarily the chain of command as was suggested. Right. So the chain of command um, is different in different circumstances. And so it, it will be impossible for us to put them in the chain of command order that would be true for all decision making. Um, an example is um, the chain of command related to employee regulations would put LNI above um, the Department of Health, of, excuse me, um, Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. But when it comes to student matters, um, Thurston County Public Health and Social Services would trump um, LNI because LNI doesn't have anything to do with students. So there, there's really not a clear progression in every circumstance about the chain of command. But if if there's a desire to change the order of that, I, I don't think it would cause any um, problems. And the next grouping here, um, I put together on purpose. Um, I'll show you, you'll, you'll figure it out here in a minute. A um, comment said, consider providing more detail on the, pro on the progression we're, we'd take. And I think what they're saying was around closing, like what steps will we take before we close the school? Um, so I, I think that is here. Those steps have to be fluid based on whatever the current regulations are. And that has changed at various times. And so those guiding principles, I don't believe are a place where we would want to put that level of specific information because we would have to be changing them as Department of Health and um, Thurston County Public Health and Social Services changes their requirements. Um, we would have to be constantly coming back to this document as opposed to using it as just general guiding principles. Um, Another comment is make strict, clear guidelines, no gray area. So again, I think that was that wanting really specific information about procedures that I don't think was ever the intention of those guiding principles. Um, avoid vague language, tell parents precisely what to do in each situation or they will ignore the requirements. Um, another person was completely on the opposite. They felt that there was too many laborious details within those guiding principles. And um, another one that was, you know, it's generic. I like black and white. They wanted more detail. 
so that those are kind of grouped together. There was a um, a comment um, that is summarized here by just saying a request to add a non-discriminatory commitment. And so you may have seen it as I was going back and forth, but there's a green section. Um, so Grant, do you want to talk about that green section? Because this was the green section is new. This is not part of the original document. Only had one through eight. Yeah, this. You know, I'll read it in case the folks have a small form factor. But RSD will not uh, differentiate COVID mitigation strategies based on an individual's vaccination status unless required to do so by governor mandate or directive, Department of Health, Labor Industries. Um, and this was based on. Um, yeah, some of the feedback we got and also some of the um, and some of the changes we've already made when we talked about what was required versus recommended and really trying to make sure we're creating a uh, a, a safe healthy uh, equity based environment uh, where folks uh, didn't feel like they were singled out uh, one way or the other based on uh, an individual's vaccination status so so, you know this so this is language to try to try to get to that uh, that point that we will not differentiate based on individuals vaccination status we do have the unless required um, right now we are not um, from uh, the, this goes back to the testing requirement we've removed moved that thank you so thank thank you for making that suggestion based on um, that feedback and um, the next section where minimize constant change, um, something should be added about revising or re revising requirements often. So some, some notation about these are going to have to be quite adjusted often. So, you know, like, I guess, warning our, our families that to expect change. Um, and then another one that said include a statement like we won't know until the county tells us we are not in charge of these decisions <laughs> so um, some things about change and then there were two other specific suggestions one was i don't like optional language about vaccines and another that was similar i don't like that um, covid vaccine opt-out was not has not been presented in this draft so um, in terms of vaccines, I can only tell you um, what I'm hearing. Well, first of all, it's never going to be the school district's um, decision about whether a vaccine needs to be man is mandated or not mandated for school age children or employees. That is always going to be outside of our jurisdiction. That's a, those are decisions that are made um, by agencies other than the school board or school administrators. Um, that it's the state board of health that makes vaccination requirements for school aged children. And it would be my understanding, it would be LNI that would make a requirement if that was a um, requirement or the governor can go above any of those things. And um, those will never be ours. We won't have the discretion to say it's mandated or it's not mandated. Um, <laughs> and so I think what people were saying is we want to see it in here that it's going to be optional, that you're not going to mandate it, and we don't have authority to do that. What I will tell you is that I've been hearing over and over again is that should the Department of Health make a determination that COVID vaccines are required for school aged children, that they um, that we can anticipate that there will be a um, opt out process, exemptions made available like there are exemptions for every other childhood vaccination requirement. So currently there are religious and medical exemptions for the other vaccination requirements. And should a vaccination requirement be put in place by this um, State Board of Health that we can anticipate there will be exemptions um, offered for that vaccination as there is for all the other vaccinations. Um, but I, I don't see there being a place for that here because it's not our decision. 
So those were the specific suggestions. There were a, lots of input. There was 250 different pieces of input given. These were the only ones that actually said do this or do that related to the actual principles. So I think now would be a good time, Grant, I'll let you kind of take over from here in terms of any adjustments the board would like to have made to the guiding principles and whether or not the board is interested in adding nine. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, nine and the, you know, any other comments that were made. I read through um, you know, many of those comments as, as uh, really just indications of, of where we've been the last uh, 24 months uh, with changing rules and, and requirements. And, and so that, that's been confusing. So, so it's very difficult to say this is how it's going to work because it's how it works today. It may not be how it's going to work two weeks from now. And, and we've seen that play out over the last 24 months. Um, so I, I'll open it up, feedback on uh, any of these items at the number nine, the, the uh, common round uh, equity and treatment. This is Neil, is this thought exchange? I know we're gonna be posting something about this. Um, is this still something that people can leave comments on or have no, the comment section been frozen? It's it's closed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested to see a lot of the different comments. Um, one comment that I have is I listened to, I listened to Jay Inslee's, uh, our governor, his press conference this afternoon. And uh, he was mentioning Chris Reichel's decision where they are planning on putting uh, mask mandates as a rule, uh, putting that on local school boards. Uh, have you guys heard any of this? I would be happy to address that. So I, I sat in a um, meeting with Chris Reichel yesterday. And um, so, and then he put out a, a press release. So I will direct that to everyone so that you can actually read exactly what he's saying. Um, so he, he has no authority to decide whether school age children are wearing a mask or not. But what he is, he is urging the governor and the Department of Health to make masking a decision um, that is pushed down to our county health officers. So our county health officers, in, in, if his recommendations adopted, our county health officers would say the data from this county is such are that uh, we know our hospitals are in good shape and our case counts are diminishing or low enough or whatever, but county by county, um, they would make a decision about whether mask regulations for school aged children would be lifted or not. Who knows if that's really what ends up happening, but that is OSPI's recommendation to the Department of Health and the governor. Um, it wouldn't, they're not saying that it would be um, a school board decision, but it would be a county health decision. And then if a county health decision said, it's fine, then it would be mass optional. And th then that would be not a school board decision or a school principal decision. It would be a family decision about whether, you know, Juana may say, no, I want my kid to continue to wear a mask. They're gonna wear a mask. And, um, you know, Juana's son's best friend may say, I don't want my kid wearing a mask. And so it, it would be a family decision in that model but none of that has been decided yet. And what I noticed this evening on the news was that um, many states the, who are ahead of us in at least setting dates for masks to become optional um, in their states are making, those, um, making them optional in public places, not necessarily in schools. And so it will be, um, interesting to see as the states who come before us in this decision-making process, if they continue to make masks required in schools 
or if they open it up, um, no one, not schools, not other public places, not no masks required. So still a lot to, to be determined. Does, does that help cleared up at all, Neil? A little, you know, Inslee likes to bumble his words. And uh, unfortunately, we had this problem about a year and a half ago. It was mid-December when Inslee got out there and he was having a conference about um, small businesses. And then he just boarded out there that, oh, yeah, local school boards. They're the ones that have the authorization to let kids back in school in, from remote. And then that was when we'd have 250 people show up at our Zoom meetings. And it's like, we don't have this control. And it's like, this isn't what was decided. It's just what he says sometimes. And the words that I heard him say today was local school boards. Again, we're going to be in charge of this masking. I totally agree. Thurston County Public Health is the one that should be in charge, uh, just like they have been with case counts, uh, teachers, the things that have been going on, mitigating circumstances in our school district at this time, um, making decisions whether or not classes are going to be closed, schools are going to be closed. Those are the things I continue to uh, expect to see through Thurston County Public Health to continue to operate and run that. I think uh, if the case counts keep going down, I could see most things opening up by April 1st, just my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, um, so thank you. Uh, I think a lot of recommendations are going to the governor right now, and yeah. we'll see where he, where it all lands. It could it could be none of the above. You know, all the things we're hearing, it could be some variation of that. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, we could have a SARS outbreak or some other version. Oh, well, of let's not go COVID. there. <laughs> I mean, we could we could have another version <laughs> of this COVID that would be more susceptible to SARS, mm -hmm. and would attack more younger children. Um, so things could really change and, and it seemed like two to three weeks and things could really be in a different place in a month or two. So hopefully that does not occur. What, what I heard at the press conference today was that uh, a commitment from the governor to um, next week uh, yeah. make an announcement with, with some dates, uh, setting expectations for uh, removing mask requirements. Uh, he wasn't willing to make those set those dates yet, but he thought it was another week of data. That uh, so he set the expectation expectation that next week they'd be setting some some dates and and what they did today was the outdoor masking for facility you know crowds lar larger than five hundred that's uh, that's removed I can't remember February eighteenth or something like that um, that's the only date they gave yep. So there is the suggestion to add um, a ninth guiding principle. So th there probably needs to be some discussion about whether you're comfortable with that and then whether there's any other changes that you want made. Um, we can continue to have discussion about this tonight or we can, um, you can, send those to me and we can finalize on at our next meeting which is gonna on the 23rd what do folks think you want to grant i grant i'd like to hold off on making any decisions on this on that number nine okay <clears throat> that's just my personal opinion <coughs> This is Neil. I agree. Um, I want to hear what the governor has to say next week. Okay. Michael, why? Jane? My personal opinion, I, I like about being equal to everyone and we don't want to discriminate because of the status of vaccination. So, but that's just my opinion. Now, that's what I was trying to get at. It, it, it was based on action we took um, uh, with, within within w where we had discretion, right? Um, so we're saying we're going to keep it equal as long as we have the discretion to do that. Yeah, Grant, I, uh, for myself, I, I don't have concerns with what I'm seeing right now. If a couple people like to get a little bit more study time into it, I'm comfortable waiting to the next meeting to vote as well. So either way, 
Um, I think we've learned one thing over the last couple of years is things do evolve. So um, I am yeah. so hopeful watching that curve come down these last couple of weeks that I hope we're near the end. But uh, um, if folks want to wait to the next meeting. I, I, I'm fine either way. Okay. Let's, uh, let's put it on hold. I was looking at item three or principle number three as you were saying that, Michael. <laughs> Continually evolving. Yeah. Continually evolving. All right. In the meantime, I would just in encourage you and anybody who has interest to um, enter into the report. You guys already all have access to it to read all 250 comments. Um, and then the rest of our community will have those have access by the end of the week. Excellent. Thanks, Kim. You're welcome. All right, so we are moving to our second opportunity for public inputs. Um, we have three folks signed up now. Um, if you'd like to sign up, please enter your name and email into the chat, and we'll call it on you in that order. So right now I have uh, John Mortensen, then Karina Watt, then Amanda Singleton. So John? Thank you, board members. <laughs> OK, I think you're unmuted now. I'm muted. You're okay. unmuted. Thank you. The members of the Rochester Community Alliance believe the district's thought exchange survey regarding PPE guidelines is biased survey serving only to justify the district's implementation of their PPE requirements. We ask the board members to be extremely careful in their deliberations regarding PPE guidelines. The survey had several paragraphs about what Washington State, Thurston County, Department of Health recommended. There was no text describing the detriments to a children's learning ability, nothing about studies done showing lower oxygen levels from masking causing lower learning comprehension or lack of facial recognition, which is so important to a child's learning. There was not a statement of fact saying that out of 74 million children in America, 910 have died from COVID-19 most of them comorbidities. Children have a 99.998% chance of surviving COVID. Matter of fact, the Thurston County, in Thurston County, we have had more deaths from teenage suicides than from COVID-19, which is tragic. Nor was anything written about masking studies that show masks have very little effect in stopping infection after 15 minutes in the classroom. The wording of the questions was completely biased. The very first question studies, which studies have shown is the most checked stated, go above and beyond safeguards. Are we not taught in life to go above and beyond? Is it not cheerleading? The wording should have been, exceed safeguards whenever possible, implement safeguards as recommended, implement only required safeguards. Other questions that should have been asked for children under the age of 18, should parents have a choice whether their child wears a mask? Should parents have a choice whether their child is vaccinated with COVID-19 and experimental use authorization vaccine? It is not state law show us the RCW, to wear masks in the classroom. Next week, Jay Inslee may leave PPE guidelines up to school districts. Will you use this survey as a way to justify further mandated PPE compliance? All we ask is that parents have choice. Thank you. Thank you. Karina and Amanda. Good evening. Thank you, board, for your discussion and standing with the community in opposition for SB 5820. Thankfully, that bill did not make it out of committee. We continue to ask that you, the board, stand with parents honoring their role as stakeholders in the following three ways. Send an email and a letter to the Washington Board of Health opposing the inclusion of COVID-19 vaccine in the 245-105 WAC for school and child care admission admission and instead request the BOH uphold parent choice or right to choose. Do not support the use of withholding access to education and child care funded by we the people hostage to political agendas. This would result in a catastrophic loss of trust 
in the public school system in the state of Washington. Opposed by vote and letter, SB 5563. Our district has ample funding to, to sustain meeting instructional needs of students within Rochester based on the actual number of students occupying the seats within the classroom. Watch Washington state parents along with taxpayers are the primary stakeholders in public education. The decline in enrollment within Washington state public schools is the direct consequence of the decision-making of the government officials who during COVID-19 pandemic implemented without sufficient scientific evidence the most restrictive policies in history of public education, creating a devastating impact on our children's academic and social emotional health. We the people demand that you stand with us and honors par honor parents' right to hold those in decision-making positions of government accountable. Oppose SB 5563, our children's future is dependent on an accountable public education system. Opposed by vote and letter, HB 1590, which changes qualifications for school board directors. It is inconceivable that school board directors would no longer be required to be a citizen of the United States or registered voter in Washington state. This would violate the duty of representation in that an individual may hold an elected position by which they are obligated to represent and serve constituents acting as their voice but have no accountability for their decisions, no responsibility for the risks or rewards they may affect upon community. And last, I would like to address the thought exchange community survey regarding the implementation of COVID-19 um, uh, mandates and proposed changes to the Rochester District's infection control program policy. Socrates once said, the 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 secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but building the new. The district's COVID-19 implementation survey was another example of the board approving and doubling down on taking a confrontational position, embracing the old rather than genuinely engaging your community. We requested a sincere dialogue and, collab um, and collaboration to identify and then act upon common principles that unify or collectively bring community community members together when implementing COVID-19 mandates. Regardless of one's politics, there is only one way forward, and it starts right here in our community, in identifying and establishing criteria that unifies, not divides, and which reflects that which is uniquely Rochester. Structuring the survey and language within for a self-serving purpose to justify your previous actions and pacify community members who extend a hand to work together is downright heartbreaking. We respectfully request a do-over and community members must be involved in the development of the survey. Proposed changes to the Rochester School District's infection control program policy should never include mandates implemented under an emergency order. The governor's proclamation number 2114, COVID vaccination requirement is a procl proclamation, not law. In the state of Washington, including um, it in the personnel policy of 5004 is unconscionable and unethical. Given it is not an RCW or a WAC, it is not supported by evidence-based research, which is the standard for public school policies. I also recommend that under the second paragraph of immunization, it should be amended to include that all that the board of directors shall have the authority and discretion to safeguard staff member positions for the sake of ensuring direct instruction or education first for our students. Should the health officer exclude based on uh, potential safety risk back versus actual safety risk in order to put our students' education and health and well-being first. As, as of late, many have said to me, you are courageous to speak at board meetings. And while I sincerely appreciate the compliment, it is undeserving. This is not courage. Rather, courage in my mind is D-Day, the Battle of the Bulge, the Korean War, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. Courage is identified by the men and women who have pledged um, to put their life on the line, to uphold the privilege of liberties that define this great nation. Speaking before you, the board is an act of humility. This is an active choice of love, not fear. It is, it is not by mistake, but rather divine intervention that we are told 365 times in the Bible, do not fear. I choose love over fear. I stand before you with not an ounce of pride, only with the humility and belief that we can never accomplish alone that which we can, that which we were designed to achieve together. 
I stand before you meeting after meeting, extending a hand of collaboration and asking to embrace it for it is the only way with integrity and grace and humility and finding those principles in our community where we can stand together, do we move forward? I stand before you not to criticize your leadership, but to inspire you to be the leaders that you are capable of becoming. You are skilled, intelligent, and have a heart for service and an opportunity before you that you have never had previously to collectively engage your community in a genuine and meaningful way. Our children deserve that. They deserve the very best we have to offer together collaboratively. So I leave you with this challenge. As Socrates said, stop fighting the old and let's start building the new. Thank you, Karina. Amanda? Hello, school board. Um, I was scanning through the website and reading the board duties. Um, number four says, speaks for the people on matters of needs and goals regarding children and their education. And number five says, provides a means by which citizens may express opinions and gain information about their schools. Um, for several months now, um, I've been coming to the school board and there have been many other parents. Um, these three minute comments are, are not producing much. Um, they don't help us know that you're representing us. Um, the think tank or thought tank or whatever it's called. Um, I, I mean, it, I just don't think it's effective. I, I read through it after I was able to access the link. I clicked on things, I made comments, but, but they're out of context and they're short and they're not a real conversation. Um, the guiding principles, number nine, um, I, guiding principles in my mind are, are much bigger and not so specific to follow laws as they change. Guiding principles are that we're not gonna discriminate. So what does that look like? That looks like if we have to do something for some people that are vaccinated or are not vaccinated, then we do it across the board. So we're not, we're not able to identify who is different from one, another person. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of asked the same question over and over and, and that's sort of what I'm hoping for. How can we have the back and forth so that it's constructive so that we feel like when you're reading these policies and having these conversations, it's truly representative of the people in the community. Um, there's a huge decision coming. Kim has really big shoes to fill and she's led our community and we've got a great district to show for it, but somebody's gonna fill those shoes and, and hopefully they're representative of this community that's here and those of us that want to be here and send our kids here. Um, you know, I don't know what the solution is. Town halls, um, more uh, conversations. I know that there's opposing views for anything that any of us say tonight, but they're not coming to the board meeting. So I, I don't know where those are coming from either. Um, it's just, it's the same ask. We really wanna be involved. We really want to know that you're representing us the way that we're asking. That's all I got. Thank you, Amanda. Justin, do we have others? No, Grant. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, we are going to go to executive session um, for how long do we? Twenty minutes? Ten minutes? Ten minutes? Can we take? So we go to ex executive session. Can we take a five minute break? Uh, and then ten minutes, so we'll be back to the full session in fifteen minutes. So with no and. No action anticipated. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Okay, um, so board members, I'll, we'll see you in five minutes.
Justin, have we filtered everybody out? I'm making sure. Looks like it. I'm going to. Did um, I need to hold on? Minutes? Hold on. I, I'm going to pause now. I'm going to let everybody back in. It's good to go, Grant. All right, thank you. We will uh, formally adjourn the meeting.